Uh, go right in. Look at this. We're live. This is fantastic. Jonathan, it's good to see you. Uh, to see I, you keep too, getting, I keep getting brighter <laughs> uh, and darker, so hopefully that'll work out. But it's good to see everybody out there. I already see people starting to pile in uh, and get into here. So I hope everybody, first of all, it's January 3rd. Uh, so that means Happy New Year uh, to everybody coming in. This is our first top 10 Q&A live of 2023, which feels insane to say. Uh, and and it's kind of like scary. So anyway, welcome yeah. to 2023. <laughs> uh, and welcome, of course, to Jonathan Boyd here. Uh, my name is Ryan Withrow, and we are really excited to kick things off and get in again to the top 10 Q&A live. Uh, we've had plenty of questions coming in since the last time, Jonathan. So I'm going to make sure that we try to fit as many as we can into here. And okay. if at any moment you feel winded and your hands start to feel like they are breaking and falling off, let me know. Uh, <laughs> and, and we can continue from there. But I feel like uh, that's good. So would you like to start off and just kind of dive in or, or where do, what are you thinking, my friend? Yeah, let's just go for it. Let's just um, start talking guitar, asking some questions, answering some questions and We'll go. Let's do it. And if at any point any of you do want to comment or ask a question, feel free to do that. And I'll make sure that we bring that here so that Jonathan can answer that as well. And uh, we'll kick off, though. You know, John, one of the first questions we have uh, is one that I don't think I've been familiar with for years because I can't remember the last time I actually owned an acoustic guitar. Um, but what are the best acoustic guitar strings? The best acoustic guitar strings. Okay. So in general, just like electric, uh, any guitar, there's, I mean, just like going to the gas station, you have tons of choices for candy bars, right? There's tons of different choices for strings. Um, I would say your, for most people, your standard basic solid string, um, something basic from D'Addario, from Ernie Ball, some of the bigger manufacturers, if you just get their standard strings, you're going to be perfectly fine. Now, this question is about acoustic strings. So when we talk about acoustic strings, obviously, there are lots of choices, just like there are for electric strings, but I want to make a distinction that acoustic strings are generally thicker than electric strings. And also one big distinction of most acoustic strings is that the, the G string is actually wound. So just like your low E string, your A string, and your D string, how they have those winds, or it sounds like, a, like, like this. It allows us to do those long scratches or dive bombs. Um, acoustic strings have a wound G string most of the time where electric strings don't. So if you're playing electric and you want to do a lot of bending, what's called a plain string or the strings without the winds will help you uh, bend and get up to the pitch that you're looking for a lot easier. On an acoustic guitar, it's a lot harder to do that because when you try to bend a wound string, you have to bend it a lot further to get to the same pitch. So if you plan on doing a lot of bending on your acoustic guitar, you might want to look for some lighter gauge strings, something that are easier to bend. Honestly, maybe even go with some electric strings. But specifically for acoustic, let's say you're playing something acoustic like finger style, strumming, uh, maybe playing around the campfire, singing and playing. Um, usually you want to go with like a medium uh, gauge string. So not super light because you don't need you don't need it to be super light. You don't need to do a lot of bending and stuff. When you go with a heavier gauge string, it'll make the sound bigger. It will sound like uh, more deep, more rich. Uh, but you also don't want to go too heavy on the string gauge because it will make your hands hurt. It would be harder to press the chords down, et cetera. So I think a general medium gauge acoustic string is about 12. Uh, 11 is kind of on the light side, but 12 is about medium. 13 is getting into thicker jazz territory. Um, now, when it comes to the actual types of strings, personally, I've played maybe four or five different types of acoustic strings. Uh, the first batch being kind of the basic solid standard acoustic strings that you can find, like I said, from D'Addario, Erdy Ball, all the big string manufacturers. Um, there are other ones that either have a, there's some colored strings, which personally I, I wouldn't recommend those because they don't sound very good, uh, but they make other strings, specifically Elixir makes uh, strings that are coated. And when I say they're coated, I mean the strings actually have a coat of Teflon or some you know proprietary material on them, which makes them feel slick. And I've found that the, number, not only does it feel better, they, they last longer because they don't get as dirty. And you can slide your hand around easier. Um, and I find that any maybe potential negative effects of the sound, uh, like sound dampening that the 
coding would cause, you don't even really notice it because the quality of your playing increases so much. So as far as best acoustic strings, I would actually give two answers. One is you can just get your standard cheap $5, $6 uh, acoustic strings from the big name brands. But I also really like the Elixir strings because they're, they're very slick and they feel very good. Nice. This is why we get along, uh, because I think I have like way too much uh, Elixir uh, merchandise in the closet. Uh, it's one of those things I feel like I should probably own stock at this point. Uh, but yeah, same reason. I, I think I just found myself changing strings so often. Uh, and yeah. because, you know, even if you play, let's be honest, even if you play 20 minutes a day uh, and you just grab the guitar, it doesn't take long uh, for a lot of the guitar strings to just get kind of like no. that, that gross grit on them. Uh, and it sounds terrible, but there's nothing like a brand new, fresh set of strings. All right. Mm -hmm. So I second that. Um, and then, you know, with that, we, you were talking about tone and okay. how the tone can change uh, with strings as well. And, you know, the coding versus non coding. Well, let's stay on tone. Let's stay on tone stuff. All right. Because we had a big question that I feel like we could just focus this whole thing on. Uh, and that is all about guitar pedals. So. Mm -hmm. The question specifically is, what are the essential guitar pedals you should have? That's a great question. So essential guitar pedals. Obviously, um, I mentioned an analogy of going into a gas station and there's a, a million candy bars that you can choose from, right? These days, it's the, it's the same with pedals. But if you look at the different types or the different categories of pedals, um, there are a lot of different ones, but the main ones boil down to a few categories. And I would say if, if you have a guitar... Um, if you're looking at pedals, you're probably going to play electric guitar. There are some people that use pedals with acoustic, but let's just focus on electric for now. So if you're playing an electric guitar, you're going to be playing through an amp. Some amps don't have reverb. And reverb is, is an effect that just adds space to the sound. It makes it sound like you're in a, in a bigger room or you can just hear the room sound rather than being what's called completely dry. So let's start with a dry amp. Let's assume you have a dry amp. And then what that means is when you play the string, when you play the string, when you play the guitar, all you're hearing is the strings themselves. The, the, the noise that's coming out of the amp is only from the strings and that's it. There's no other effects, right? So the first thing that most people do is you, you want to add, um, it depends on your style too. So I, I, should, I should make a disclaimer because a lot of people have different tastes in sounds and what kind of sounds they want. Uh, which will determine what kind of pedals they use. So I'm just going to give a general, what kind of pedals do most people use, okay, depending on what style of music that you want to play. Now, back to the reverb. Assuming you have a completely dry amp, which means when you strum, all you're hearing is the guitar strings themselves, that's it. You probably want to make your sound a little bit wetter. And what that means is adding space. So adding a little bit of reverb. So it sounds, it sounds more musical. It just sounds easier to listen to. It's not harsh. It's not so dry and... and like a like a dry twig or something that feels like it's 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 it just doesn't feel right it doesn't feel good when it's so dry like that. So adding a little bit of reverb will make it feel like you're in a room with somebody. Okay, um, and you can adjust the size of the room depending on what type of reverb. There's a bunch of different types of reverb, but I'm just focusing on the essential uh, effect here, which is reverb. So you can make it sound like you're in a big cathedral with a huge echo, you know, uh, or just a tiny coffee shop, something that's very up close. I would say that's number one. Uh, actually, let me back up. Number one is a tuner. If you don't have a tuner, some people have clip-on tuners. Uh, those are usually easier, honestly. But I would say if you don't have that, get a pedal tuner because and put that first thing uh, you know on your pedal board if you have one because you, you want to be in tune, number one. So I would say uh, tuner is number one, and then reverb would be number two. I would also say I would, I would recommend two more. One would be a distortion pedal. So distortion is obviously what gives that a guitar that crunchy sound, um, makes it sound kind of more like rock and roll versus cl a clean sound. You can get a clean sound with any amplifier. Lots of amplifiers these days have a distortion sound or gain built into the amp, but a lot of times you might want a different type of, of gain or a different type of crunch. Uh, speaking of which, you might want a crunchy sound kind of like classic rock versus um, a super heavy metal sound uh, that's like a really high gain sound. And depending on the amps, we're not talking about amps here, we're only talking about pedals, but depending on what amp you have, let's assume you have a what's called a neutral amp, which means it can take on any effects pretty well. You can choose the type of distortion that you want from anything from 
a very almost clean but slightly dirty kind of a sound you might hear in Motown or old blues or something like that. And then you can also crank up the distortion. There's tons of different distortion pedals out there that will allow you to get as heavy as you want. I would say the, the second essential pedal outside of the tuner is a distortion pedal. And I would say the last thing is if you want to add a little bit more space in your, uh, in your sound, in, depending on what type of music you want to play or what type of sound that you want in any particular part of a song, is I would probably add a delay pedal. And what a delay pedal does is it does what it says it does. So when you play, you hear the sound, the initial sound, and then you hear a delayed version of the sound as well. You can adjust the timing. You can adjust the what feels like space. Um, speaking of space, a delay pedal can make it your sound sound spacey, right? But a, a, a little bit of delay, and I don't mean this to rhyme, but a, a little bit of delay can go a long way. What I mean is if you're playing with a band or if you're recording on top of a band with where there's tracks in the background, a little bit of delay can just somehow set your guitar into the mix. It can make it seem like part of the same painting. And I know that sounds kind of strange, but rather than hearing separate instruments, um, let's say you hear a track and then you hear a guy playing a guitar over the top of that. You could tell that the guy over the top is playing over the top of a song. But if he adds a little bit of delay and if his playing is good, it actually sounds like he's part of the song, like he's part of the recording. So that's what a little bit of delay can do for you. So with essential pedals, I would say at a bare minimum, get a tuner. You might want a little bit of reverb to make your sound sound a little wetter. You probably want a distortion pedal, depending on what type of music you want to play. And then obviously I would probably add a delay pedal as well, just so you have that option um, to have a delay effect and add more space to your sound. Yeah, good. Um, yeah, it's, you described everything that I do every day as far as setting up the template ready to play. It's just distortion, uh, delay, reverb, um, yeah. and really uh, tooling with those as needed for leads versus rhythm parts and everything as well to fit in. And uh, Guitar Sweep here said a looper pedal is also a great way to learn rhythms and then practice yeah. soloing over it. Yeah, thanks for that recommendation. I agree. Uh, it's definitely good to have a looper pedal, maybe if you're a little bit more advanced and you, you know how to play a chord progression or something and loop that chord progression, or even a drone track or, or something that you can play on top of. Um, having a loop pedal can be extremely helpful when you're practicing, especially improvising or, or writing a part. But for, the, for most guitar players who aren't going to do something like that, or maybe who aren't, who aren't there yet, um, I would say our, you know, our main three are good for now. Add a loop pedal later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then uh, Russ over here asked a specific question and my nerdy self had to go grab something. Uh, <laughs> Russ asked, have you played Nano or Polyweb? Are they worth the extra? So, uh, you know, there you go. There it is. Uh, my go-to, yeah, Nano Web. So I, I don't know about you, Jonathan, but like I've tried both of them for Elixir. And a lot of times I find that like the Polyweb is too much, too much coding. So, you know, who knows? Uh, no, the Polyweb, I think it goes Polyweb, NanoWeb, and then OptiWeb, which is, wait, wait, what part of the future is that from? I don't even know. What, <laughs> what is that? What is the chemical compound that equals OptiWeb? Uh, is, it on, is it on the chart? I don't know. Um, but yeah, I, I always go with the NanoWeb personally. They just seem to be the best fit for me. And I would say they're worth it just because they're longevity at that point. It's like, you know, my wife always compares like cost per wear uh, for things. It's like cost per play. I don't have to change them as often. So I don't know. That, there you go, Russ. Hopefully that's helpful. And I, I think Jeff on our, our crew here who just does so much sound and uh, recording work for a lot of top artists, he's always just a big believer of just try strings. If you're even interested, yeah. like buy one pack and just try it. See if it works. See how it feels. Totally. Uh, as another add on to that might be a helpful tip. So I play a lot of tennis. And I have, because of that, I have uh, the same tennis racket, a bunch of different versions of the same tennis racket. And what I'm actually doing now, and I do this very often, is I try different tennis strings. Uh, if you don't play tennis, a lot of people don't realize that, that tennis players change their strings. And just like guitar players, there's different types of strings that you can optimize. So I actually have three different rackets with three different types of strings. And on the bottom of the racket, I write which string is on there so I know what I'm playing with. It's the same thing with a guitar. So yeah, just try a bunch. That's so funny. I look at all of my guitar cases labeled with <laughs> with the string gauge and the tuning that they're in because it gets confusing otherwise. <laughs> all right. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's it's really fun. You'll start to realize that a, a new string change 
could completely revolutionize. Like your, your plan could just explode just based off that one small yeah. change. Um, it's incredible. So let's kind of bring it back. We talked uh, obviously strings and pedals. And during the pedal conversation, uh, you kicked it off with saying more than likely you're, you're talking electric guitar stuff here. Mm -hmm. So let's keep that electric guitar stuff going. Uh, one of the other questions that I'm like, man, we could just, the, the whole Q and A could just be this. What's the best electric guitar for beginners? Man, that's a big question. So as a beginner guitarist, you don't know what you don't know. Um, actually, as an advanced guitarist, you don't know what you don't know, right? We always don't know what we don't know. But in the beginning, you don't really know anything about playing guitar. Uh, you have to learn everything for the very first time. So we need to think about what, if you stop playing, then you're not going to keep playing. I know that sounds too simple, but but if something is in your way or causing a roadblock or frustration, et cetera, chances are you're, you're going to put the guitar down and you're not going to keep playing it. In fact, there's a study by Fender in 2020 one i think um it was either 2020 or 2021 where they found that within the first 12 months of a, a beginning guitar player buying their first guitar and playing for the very first time they found that within 12 months nine out of ten of those guitar players quit now i bring mm -hmm. that up because clearly there's a lot of roadblocks in the way to get started playing guitar and actually start playing it in a way that that's fun right you start to make music with it etc so the reason I bring that up is because um, the I think the most important thing to consider is what is going to keep you playing, what is going to allow you to start playing easily and keep, and get you to want to keep playing. So with those things in mind, um, let's we don't need to talk about necessarily brands or anything like that. In the beginning, it really doesn't matter at all what brand of guitar you play. In fact, I had a a red acoustic. Um, it was called a checkmate, a checkmate guitar. And I got it from my uncle. Uh, my uncle passed and it was under his bed and it was a long story, but I got that guitar and I played it for years and I really liked it. I played, I could play blues really well on it. And I looked it up on eBay one day and it was literally like $3 and 40 cents. It was a $3 guitar. So it really doesn't matter in the beginning, uh, you know, how much the guitar costs in general, Obviously, the higher, you know, just like anything, if you buy a more expensive car, the, the parts are going to be more quality, etc. But in the beginning, all you really care about is getting something decent enough that's easy and fun to play. What makes it easy and fun to play? In my opinion, um, I think it's important to have something that you like to look at. Like if if you look at your guitar and it makes you excited, well, it's going to make you want to pick it up. Right. And we, we remember the most important thing is picking it up in the beginning and keep picking it up and always picking it up and never stop picking it up. Like that's the most important thing. So if you get something that you like, maybe people hate this guitar. I think it's pretty cool. It makes me want to touch it. makes me want to play it. Um, I think that's the most important thing or one of the most important things in the beginning. So if you go to a guitar shop or if you're looking online or something, find something that you think looks cool. Right. Uh, second, you want to, if we're talking about electric guitars, you want to find something that is physically easy to play. So the neck size, can you reach, can you wrap your hand around it? Does it feel reasonably comfortable to you? Um, or is it just, is it just huge? Like some necks are just huge. It feels, it just feels awkward. It feels uncomfortable and you can't really ever uh, get used to it. Even it doesn't matter how many years you play some guitars, you just never, you never get used to. Um, on the opposite end of the spectrum, there are some necks that are super, super thin, which also you can't really ever get used to. It gives you cramps uh, in your hand, things like that. So that's something to, to consider. If you go into a guitar store or something, you can ask somebody what might be a medium neck size. You know, uh, Somewhere in the middle will probably be good for most people. Also, I would say the, the what's called the action. So the height of the strings above the fretboard. If I look at the guitar like this, how high are the strings off the fretboard? And also how bowed is the neck and the the most people don't realize in the beginning at least that your neck is supposed to have a little bit of a bow to it it's called relief um you can take your guitar to a luthier or to just a shop a uh, guitar shop or something and somebody will what's called setting up your guitar they'll set up your guitar for you to make it easier to play and they will put that perfect amount of relief in there uh, that you need and, and your action meaning the height of the strings off the fretboard if that's too high you're not going to want to play because your fingers need to get used to pressing down the strings and if it's too high it's going to be too hard too frustrating it's going to be painful you're going to want to put the guitar down 
So you want something with a pretty low action um, that's easy to press the strings down, but not too low because it will be buzzy and you won't be able to have a good sound. And then I would also say if you take your guitar somewhere to have somebody change the strings or get it set up, I would recommend starting with um, nine gauge strings or even eight gauge strings. In fact, I play eight gauge strings and my dad actually plays seven gauge strings now. And it's just because once you, in my experience, once you start playing it and you, you get used to how light the touch is, you just don't want to ever go back. You have so much more control over the strings. Um, whereas I used to be the opposite. I used to try to play 13s on my electric guitar, which some people would call, you know, a telephone pole string really hard to bend, really hard to press down, et cetera. And over the years I've gone down and gauge. So the, the strings are just so easy to press and that just makes it so much more enjoyable um, to play. Now, the third thing, the third main big thing is the sound. Do you like the sound of the guitar? Does it sound inspiring to you? Even if you can't play anything yet, can you strum it? Does it just, the sound of the guitar, does it just, you know, vibrate against your body? Does it make you want to pick it up? Does it make you want to explore the fretboard? If so, probably a good choice. So that's it. I think, I think that's what I would say are the three or four most important things for a beginning electric guitar. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I think mine was a Yamaha electric, uh, that was used and it was already in bad shape. Uh, but you know, it, it worked. It looked like a strat. Like it, it, it was like a strat yeah. style and, I don't know. It just worked. And before I knew it, I wore out the frets completely. And I was like, well, I got to figure out another solution now. Um, but yeah, yeah, just, I don't know, somewhere is the goal. And then I think you learn the lessons from people like Jonathan here, as far as uh, string gauge. I didn't start getting into nines until probably three years ago, four years ago, John. And yeah, I can't go back. Uh, I had a guitar shipped yeah. to me with nines after I requested tens uh, on accident. So I just pulled it out and started playing. And I was like, all of them got to change. I got to change them all to nines. This, this is so much easier. Um, again, though, like we recommend with the strings, just try it. I I'd start yeah. with the nines. If, if you're like, yeah, I feel like I could go heavier gauge. It's not a crazy thing to change them and get it reset up and try a different uh, gauge string. It's, it's something you should do to feel comfortable for sure. Um, so good. Hey, so Russ here is, is asking a question directly to this, uh, which is, do you find a 9.5 inch radius neck easier to play than a 12 inch radius neck? That's a great question. So there's something we haven't talked about yet, which is the radius of the fretboard. What that means is how curved is the fretboard? And again, that's something that most people, unless you start getting really into guitar, most people don't even know that that's a thing. They think the fretboard is flat and it's absolutely not if you pick up a classical guitar, most classical guitar fretboards are flat. A lot of modern ones are have a little bit of a curve, but they're they're mostly flat. And this is I will I will give my general suggestions and then my preferences. So in general, the more curved the fretboard is, the more comfortable it's going to be to play chords. Why? Because if you relax your hand, your fingers are already curved. So it's just natural to press down something like this, right? The problem with that is, as soon as you want to start bending strings, because the you're basically playing on like a, a, a barrel, your strings can, for lack of a better term, get buzzy. They can do what's called fretting out, which means the notes won't ring. And it's just frustrating. It, you can't really sound that great on it. And you might have to raise your action higher than you want. The When you start to make your fretboard flatter, like instead of having such a radius like this, and you start to make it more flat like this, or even dead flat like this, a couple things happen. Number one, the, st the strings themselves are easier to reach whenever you go up and down the fretboard like this. Why? Because they're, it's just a little bit, but they're closer to your fingers on this side and on this side. It doesn't seem like it would make that much of a difference, but it makes a massive difference. Um, so uh, mo most like Les Pauls and Gibsons are like a 12 inch radius. Um, Ibanez, to give you an example, is, is actually 15.75 inches for most uh, people. They measure in millimeters. That's why it's different. Um, old vintage Fender guitars like Telecasters, Strats are 7.5. The modern ones are 9.5. The even more modern ones, they're moving to 12 because flatter is easier to play lead guitar. It's easier to bend because you can get a lower action. This guitar actually has a 20-inch radius, so it's very 
what people would call flat. Technically, it's not flat, but it's it, it doesn't have much of a curve to it at all. Uh, you probably can't see that, but it's it's very shallow curve. I actually prefer playing on a guitar with no radius at all. I prefer playing on a perfectly flat fretboard. And the reason is because once you get used to pressing the chords down, it's so much easier to hit the individual notes and you can play a lot faster and your action can be as low as possible and you can bend wherever you want without ever having to deal with buzzing or fretting out. Um, one of, in my opinion, one of the greatest guitar players of all time, Sean Lane, um, he, his signature guitar, it's made by a company called Vigier and it's called the Excalibur. Sean passed away a long time ago, but uh, his guitar, if you, go look up at this, uh, if you go look at the specs, he has a perfectly flat fretboard. And I've never seen a production electric guitar from any player who has a perfectly f uh, flat fretboard. But Sean used to play classical, and he's an amazing piano player, etc. So it just depends on what you want to do. Uh, different specs will unlock different styles of playing. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I come from the school of classical, so uh, I I kind of you know echo that uh, a bit as well. Um, yeah, excellent, good. Well, Russ over here is just getting us all the all the details and all the questions thank you russ uh and you mentioned soloing you mentioned lead guitar why not lead into some lead guitar things well, let's do it uh so i have a question specifically about about blues so what john is the uh blue scale on guitar what is the blue scale on guitar and why the heck is it useful that's a great question so what is the blue scale you can probably find this anywhere out there there's there's so many people talking about a blues scale but what what does it actually mean what does that mean well when you play guitar and ryan let me know if you can hear this guitar can you hear that i can i'm, I'm okay. here in the middle of nowhere you don't even see me but yes i can <laughs> okay so when we talk about blues most people will bring up the pentatonic scale right and they will say most people start with what they call the minor pentatonic scale which looks like this <laughs> The thing is, that's actually not the minor pentatonic scale. It can be a minor pentatonic scale or a major pentatonic scale or a number of other things, but that's, that's a topic for a different time. Um, when you play this scale, there are notes in the scale. Most people use this pattern for playing blues and any number, uh, excuse me, any number of other pentatonic patterns for playing blues, but that's the most common one, what they call position one or the minor pentatonic scale. Again, that's not correct, but that's what they call it. Um, when we talk about uh, a blue, any scale, a scale is a certain set of notes. That's all it is. That's literally the definition of a scale. It, out of 12 notes in music, if we pick a certain number of them and play them one at a time or whatever, that is the scale. That is what a scale is. So if we play this pentatonic scale, there's five notes in this scale that repeat over and over again. So let's just call the notes one, two, three, four, five. In the blue scale, or what they call the blue scale, they actually add one additional note. So there's six notes in a blues scale, but they don't call it one, two, three, four, five, six. What they do is they add what's called the flat five. And if we count, <laughs> I don't wanna have to over explain, but in a major scale, there's seven notes. So here's a bit of a major scale. That's seven, that's one again. So we have one, two, three, four, five. This note right here is the fifth note. Now. What does flat mean? Flat means down one fret. Most people think down in terms of down this way, down in terms of vertical, but no, down means down in pitch, and that's always away from your body, okay? So flat means down, or one fret away from your body. So if this is the fifth note, how do I flatten this note or make it flat or play the flat five? I just go one fret down, same string. Now it sounds wrong, right? So if I play this, that, and then the fifth note, this is the fifth note in the major scale. That's the flat fifth note in the major scale. Now, we don't have time right now to explain how does the pentatonic scale relate to the major scale. The basics is that the pentatonic scale is only five out of the seven notes from the major scale. Let's just assume we take the fifth note from the major scale and we slap in the flat five of the major scale in the pentatonic scale. So I'm gonna say that again. We're gonna take the fifth note of the major scale, we're gonna make it flat, and we're going to take that flat note and put it into our pentatonic scale, okay? So if I play the pentatonic scale, it looks like this. If I add the flat five, which is 
right here. It's going to sound like this. Right there. And then I keep playing. And then there's one more place where it occurs. I think it is. Uh, here. There. And so I don't use that note a lot, which is why I have to figure out where it is. But that's what a blues scale is. A blues scale is a pentatonic scale with the flat five of the major scale added in there. Nice. Nice. Yeah. 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 So I, I think that, uh, again, not every one of these, I'm like, we could just talk, you know, writing music and, and major scales and everything all day if we want to, but we'd probably lose everybody watching, uh, at this point. So that's okay. That's all right. Um, so I guess for me then, uh, the second part of that question is, you know, why is it useful? You know, why should we be using it? How do I yeah. use it? How do I incorporate it? Great question. So what's the point of using any scale notes? To play them in a song. Okay. Why would you play scale notes versus chords? The basic answer is because you're playing lead versus rhythm guitar. That's the basic answer. So why, how, how and why would you use the flat five or the blue note is what they call it, or the blues scale, right? How would you use that? Well, if I'm playing something in, um, in the pentatonic scale, maybe just basic notes like this, something basic blues like that, I can sound basic blues all day. Like well, whatever it is, it's gonna sound the same. But if I add this note in there occasionally, that note, it makes it, it takes you to a different scene in a movie. It's a little bit different. It makes it sound a little cooler. It's a, it has extra what people call flavor to it, right? So I can even add the, I can even play it over and over again. Something like that. Or I can go. And you hear that in maybe some Led Zeppelin songs or something. So something like that. Or I don't know. It doesn't matter what you do. If you find creative ways to add in that blue note or the flat five note, like I said, it just adds a little bit of extra, like that gritty, soulful, nasty flavor to your blues playing. And that's how you can add it in. Good, good. And then we'll just we'll just jam uh have you play to some backing tracks for the rest of the time uh today <laughs> just with some blue note. Um but yeah, yeah, no. Um I agree. I I'd like to say also throw in the word tension, right? I think yeah, yeah. that musically we want like we're just trained even if you know nothing about music. Even if you know nothing about music theory, all your life you've been listening to music. And you'd be amazed at how much your ear is trained musically without even realizing it's trained musically. So a lot of the times we're looking for tension and for it to resolve. And I think adding yeah. those notes out of context really help with the tension as well. For perfect. Sure. Well, let me give you a perfect example. So let's say I'm going to play this and then this and I go, you don't feel good right now. You're like, ah. Oh. And then I go here. Now it's like, oh, okay, good. And then I go to, to resolve the whole thing. Now we're back to the beginning, right? So that's a perfect example of what you were just talking about with adding the tension in there. Yeah, yeah, and you have to have the tension face as well uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. as you do it. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> absolutely a requirement. Um, okay, so I think let's let's keep this talk going. I mean, we're talking about scale, solo work, all of that. So let's just okay. lead into. Another question, very similar, but not specific to blues. Um, the easiest way to play guitar solo. What is the easiest way to play a guitar solo? Can you repeat the question again? <laughs> yeah. What is the easiest way to play a guitar solo? Okay, so guitar solos. There's actually two ways to play a guitar solo. First of all, what is a guitar solo? Um, I mean, a basic definition of a guitar solo is that in a song, there's a period of space or period of time where the guitar is the lead instrument, right? Um, it can be melody, it can be all kinds of anything that anybody can ever do on the guitar neck, they can do that. But the point is, the band is playing in the background and the, the guitar is playing in the lead or in out in front, right? And there's two ways you can play a solo. One is, it's very simple. One is, you can know what you're going to play. And the other one is, you can not know what you're going to play. So when you know what you're going to play, that's an easier way to practice your soloing skills um, because you can practice, let's say there's a song with a solo or with a lead part that you really like. 
you can focus and break that solo down little piece by little piece by little piece by little piece until you've learned the whole thing. And then you can do what's called rehearsing. So when we practice, we're trying to get better at a particular skill. When we practice a whole song or practice playing a, a composition or a piece, that's called rehearsing. So we can rehearse the solo at that point. So after we rehearse the solo, then whenever, let's say, we play at a coffee shop or we just play for our own enjoyment at home uh, over our favorite songs or wherever it is on stage, if you're in a band, you play the solo as it was written, as you learned it, as you rehearsed it. Okay, that's the first way that you can play a solo. And that's usually where everybody starts. The second way is by not knowing what you're going to play. And that's what we call improvising. So I want to make a distinction between soloing and improvising. You can play a solo that is not improvised. And you can also improvise. That's not a solo. So what I mean is you can play uh, in the background. You can improvise what you're playing while maybe another part of the band, like a saxophone player, for example, is playing a solo or is playing the lead part, right? Improvising just means you're improvising. It means you're making it up on the spot. Now, obviously, improvising as a guitar and music is a lifetime pursuit. Anyway, improvising is a double lifetime pursuit, right? Um, it's something that you you're always pursuing, you're always getting better at. It's just like reading. Like if you if you like to read books, if you like to learn things, there's no end point for learning things. You're just gonna wanna keep getting smarter and smarter and smarter and smarter. That's how it works with uh, improvising as well. So with improvising, I know this question wasn't about how to improvise, it was about how the easiest way to play a solo. The easiest way to play a solo is to um, Learn a simple solo from a song you like and learn it piece by piece by piece by piece until you can put the whole thing together and then rehearse the whole thing in a song so that you can play it with the song. That's the easiest way to start playing solos. As a little bit of a bonus tip, if you want to start being able to improvise, what I always recommend is you start with what we call the seven feelings or a little box that has the seven different feelings in it. And that allows you to, it allows your ear to hear the different tensions, the different feelings that you want to play when you hear background music. And that will get you used to starting to move around on the fretboard a little bit. And then we have tools and we have frameworks and things that we can build, um, like the Freedom Key system, for example. There's a seven string pattern that we use that literally unlocks the entire fretboard. Sounds crazy because I say seven strings. Most people have a six string guitar, but it is a seven string pattern. You have to imagine the imaginary string. My point is, we have these tools that will allow you to improvise um, more and more and more on the fretboard. Now, when it comes to the style of what you do with all those tools on the fretboard, uh, it goes back to what I said about reading. It's kind of like if you remember going to school, maybe you had a library, maybe they uh, made you read some books and they have what's called reading levels. So at third grade reading level, it's, it's reading level for third graders. When you go to fifth grade, you have a fifth grade reading level. When you go to 12th grade, you have a 12th grade reading level or a college level reading level. Learning music, and especially improvising, is exactly like learning a language because it is a language. When you, you need to start out at a low, quote, reading level so that your phrases, the things that you're trying to say, are very simple, um, your musical sentences, so to speak. And the more uh, advanced you get, the better you get at, at improvising and, and doing, uh, executing these musical ideas that you have just like sharing your opinion with your mouth, that's what you're doing when you're improvising on guitar. You're sharing your musical opinion. You're sharing your, your emotional opinion is what it really is. Um, when you progress, you, it's just like reading more books. How do you progress in your reading level? You learn more words and you read more books because new books give you new ideas. So listening to music and listening to, over time, more and more and more complex music gives you more and more and more complex musical ideas that you will then, over time, incorporate to your playing until you're somebody like Joe Satriani or Gary Moore or, you know, Eric Clapton or any of those guys, right? Um, they're not any different than any of us. They just followed the process that I just laid out and they've just been doing it a long time. Yep. Yep. And, and nobody here likes Joe Satriani at all. No, no, it's not. <laughs> I don't have posters signed by him behind my desk right now. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's, and you didn't go to his concert the other day. I not at all. Uh, and you didn't meet him backstage either. I didn't. No. Um, yeah. 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 And it's. I think it's funny when you hear uh, when you really admire certain players too. Uh, hearing them say the same exact things that we say about ourselves and to ourselves as well. So everything oh, you yeah. just said, 
I, I did in fact talk to Joe about like his practice routines and how he gets everything moving. And it was very funny to hear him say like, I still kind of stink at what I was bad at when I was young. Like I just, I found workarounds. I did stuff around it. I don't know. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's very funny uh, to hear that. So that's good. I, I think that that makes a lot of sense and coming again from like classical guitar and learning music step by step, measure by measure it. It's very helpful in that way. And I think the other thing that a lot of people don't realize is when you're learning those solos and those lead parts from all of the players you like, you start to kind of take a little bit of each of them uh, in a way to create your own style. I mean, 100% of guitarists are created as a culmination of all the guitarists they followed and listened to and played until they created their own unique style uh, as well. So very good. Very good. Um, so, you know, you mentioned... Uh, some of the systems that we have, uh, mm -hmm. but let's kind of take the higher view of this and think about lessons themselves. Uh, this is a question that I think, especially nowadays, we hear a lot and it's just, should you take guitar lessons? There you go. Yeah, that's a great question. Should you take guitar lessons? Well, the answer is usually the same. It depends, right? What does it depend on? Well, it depends on what do you want to do with a guitar? And you know, I'm not trying to be funny here. Really, I want you to consider this. What do you actually want to do on the guitar? If there's somebody who wants to be able to pick up the guitar and, or actually let's, let's go even further back. Let's say they don't even want to pick up the guitar and they just want to have it on the wall or they just want to have it in the corner or something like that. Well, do you need to take lessons? No, if you're not going to play it, right? Um, what about if you only want to be able to play like literally three chords and uh, you know, get it out when your friends come over and play those three chords and put it away. And that's, that's all you ever want to do. Some people just want to do that. Do you need lessons for that? Well, I wouldn't say you need to pay for lessons for that. You're going to get a lesson no matter what, because somebody's going to show you the chords. So technically it, it, the question is, should you take guitar lessons? Well, the, the real answer is everybody takes lessons in some form. I think the question is about, should you actually pay for guitar lessons? Um, so, now let's progress even further. Let's say that all you want to do on guitar is pick, a, pick it up and play a few, a few chord songs, right? So now we're getting a little bit more advanced. That's not advanced, but it is more advanced than the previous examples. So if you want to be able to, to, do, to just do that, should you take guitar lessons? I would say yes, because it would speed it up. But if you don't really care about timing and you don't really care about running into roadblocks and being a little bit more frustrated and you just want to figure it out yourself, you don't need it go for it right some people do that and some people are i wouldn't say they're completely satisfied with doing that but they get along fine it's good enough right if that's all you ever want to do if you want to progress beyond that if you want to pro progress beyond playing a few you know what they call cowboy chords or open chords uh, at, the, at the, the first three frets of the neck and you want to get do anything outside outside of that yes i do think you should take guitar lessons however um it's just like um, if you don't know who Pat Metheny is, he's one of the best, in my opinion, jazz guitar players of all time. Uh, when, when he was asked about playing jazz or about listening to jazz or why many people don't like jazz or something like that, uh, he, he said something to the effect of jazz is just like anything else. 95% of it really sucks. And it's just the 5% that's really good. But everything's like that. Rock and roll is like that. Right. There's a billion songs out there. But how many songs do you really like? Not that many. I mean, you can you can like a ton of songs, but compared to a billion, it's just not even a drop in the bucket. Right. So the reason I bring that up is because the question then becomes the question becomes at that point, if you want to progress past that point more than uh, you know outside of the first three frets and only playing a few basic chords, kind of OK. If you want to progress beyond that, I think it's not even a question of should you or do you want to take guitar lessons? I think it's, it's really the only way to really excel um, in, your, in your playing. The key is that it depends on who you take lessons from or what you take lessons from or where you learn from. Just like Pat Metheny's quote, it's just the truth. 95% of the stuff out there just really sucks. And it's, it's going to confuse you more. It's going to make you more frustrated. It's going to cause more problems. It's going to give you bad habits. Um, not that anybody necessarily does that on purpose, right? People just teach what they know. And a lot of people don't know really that much. And they, they teach people who are uh, behind them and maybe set them up to get stuck later, right? That happens all the time, especially with a comment that I made earlier where all, everybody calls the this pattern the, the minor pentatonic scale, and that's just not accurate, 
right? Uh, it can be the minor pentatonic scale, but if you think about it that way, you're going to get stuck later. It's just a fact. I see it happen all the time. So in terms of should you take guitar lessons or not, again, if you want to progress and actually be able to play the guitar and be good at it and play songs and play um, maybe lead guitar or something like that, I think you should take guitar lessons uh, simply because it's going to speed up your process. Do you have to? No. There are a lot of people who never took, quote, formal lessons, but they did take lessons from other people. And it may not have been in a formal setting, but they learned from somewhere. That's what I'm saying. And there's because of that, there is no such thing as being self-taught. Everybody is taught from somebody else. It just may, may not be in a formal lesson setting, right? Um, so again, it's not so much about should you take guitar lessons or not. If you want to progress to, with your playing to the point where you you want to really be able to play the guitar, play the guitar, solo, improvise, play more complex songs, etc., uh, then yes, I do agree and I do think that taking guitar lessons is a faster, more efficient route to get there. What you have to be careful about is that you make sure you're going to the person or to the program or to the, you know, whatever it is, course, book, audio, whatever it is that you're learning from, you have to make sure that that source um, can get you specifically uh, around the challenges that you have and can get you to your goals that you actually have with your guitar playing, your specific goals. So extreme example of that, if you want to learn classic rock, then you don't want to go to the, the finger style, uh, you know, acoustic guitar teacher because he doesn't play classic rock. It's just going to be a step in the wrong direction. Will you learn some things? Yes. But then that, that the, the term opportunity cost comes into play. We don't have unlimited years and guitar takes years to learn. So if you're going down the wrong path for years, well, just imagine how much time you wasted and how much time you could have saved and how far along you could have been if you would have went down the right path from the beginning. So I know that's a longer answer than we were probably expecting, but I, I think it's it's wrong to not give a complete answer. Yeah, good. And I think it's scientifically proven time and time again that if you are playing with mistakes and incorrectly, it's twice as hard, if not harder than that, to reverse it and go back and learn it the right way. Um, I'm a product of that and a few of my guitar playing skills uh, for sure. Like, I think I... For years, I never used a pinky, man. And I, yeah. I don't know why. I don't know why. Yeah. I just didn't. And I went to college level classical guitar. <laughs> and I remember my first lesson with, with Stephen Aaron, like this incredible classical guitarist. Uh, he stopped me, he just grabbed my hand in the middle of playing and just said, like, what's wrong with your pinky? What are you doing? <laughs> like, what is going on here? And it was a year of hard work working with him to start incorporating that into all the scale yeah. work and everything. Yeah. yeah. So it's, yeah. it's true. It's very good. Yeah. Very good. Cool. So let's, let's keep expanding on that. Uh, I know that we gave a little bit of the specific, but another question we had kind of goes hand in hand with this a little bit and kind of leads us perfectly into this question. Um, types of guitar lessons. What are the best kind of guitar lessons? So if you, you're saying you need some lessons more than likely in some way, shape or form, what are the best kind? Where do I start? Yeah, again, great question. So there's a zillion different methods to learn guitar out there, right? Um, or let's just call it channels. There's a bunch of different channels that you can use to get information about the guitar. Um, for example, nowadays we have cell phones and they have apps, right? That, that maybe they play little games or something that you can learn, learn guitar on. Um, there's obviously books, there's in-person teachers, there is online courses, there are online classes. There, there's, there's a ton of different things. And this is going to sound way too simple at first, but I really want you to be thinking about this when you go out there and you're looking for what you should be doing. You want to do what works. So different people are different, right? People are wired in different ways. Some people learn visually. Some people learn by hearing things through audio. Some people learn only through experience. Some people have to mistake, make mistakes before they learn, oh, I shouldn't do that. I need to do this. So people learn in different ways. Um, most of the methods of guitar that you're going to be learning um, are incorporating what's called it's multimodal learning, which means uh, more than one of the modes of learning, which means visual or auditory or you know experiential, whatever. Um, the thing that you have to cons consider and look out for is is two things really. Uh, one, how do you learn? How do you like to learn? If you look back to your past. In times when you can think of 
uh, where you learned the most or where you really maybe understood a concept, maybe from school or maybe from a project that you did or maybe from uh, somebody that you worked with or, you know, anything. If you can think back to a time where you really learned something, you really enjoyed it and you really um, you really remember it. Right. It, you think about the, the mode in which you learned. Were you there with somebody? Were you were you reading a book? Do you remember a lot of books, et cetera? That can be an indicator on the direction that you should go in, um, at least to start, right? At least to start with your guitar playing. Ultimately, uh, well, let me back up. I'll get to the ultimate step here in a second. Um, if you look at a nonfiction book, a nonfiction book is a, a book that's not a made up story. It's like, let's say a business book or a, a personal development book or, or a how-to book. Let's call it a how-to book. A how-to book, let's say there's somebody who uh, has, I don't know, played football for 30 years. And they take all that 30 years of knowledge, they condense it down into a perfect outline of all the key steps and the key things that you need to know, um, you know, to enhance your football playing or to get better at football or to play a certain position or even to, you know, how to coach a team or whatever it is. They condense all their knowledge down to this one um, medium, which is a book, right? A modern version of that on steroids is a course. And the reason courses can be so effective if, if they're organized if they address the subject that you want to learn. And obviously, if they help you overcome your specific challenges, there's a bunch of ifs in there. Uh, but the reason is because it's a multimodal approach, which means you get to learn by watching, but through video in, in, per, in, in person instruction. It's not actually in person, but it's like in person instruction. You get to, at least the way we do it, you, you get to uh, read the action steps or the things that you need to be doing. And then also there may be some visuals, right? Some charts or some tabs or or uh, whatever it is that you need to use for resources and also the audio part. So you can hear somebody playing something. You can watch them in a video playing it, or you can hear them playing it, or you can listen to a track of somebody playing something or playing uh, them playing something in the background when you're supposed to be playing. And all of that is recorded for you. It's there for you to have and to review and to go at your own pace. Now, if you, a book can do the same thing, but there's not that visual movement part, right? It, it's missing a part of the mode is what I'm saying. Uh, the the games that are out there, like on the apps, personally, I've never seen one that can actually teach somebody how to play real guitar. I mean, it's it can be fun for a little while, but you're not going to become a pro guitar player by using an app. It, you're just not. Um, the only other alternative, and this is the experience that I've seen over and over and over again, the people that progress the most tend to find a particular, like a course. Uh, most people, a lot of people start out with books. They don't find the, exactly the answer that they're looking for. Actually, let me do this full, the full spectrum here. Most people try to teach themselves in the beginning. They don't. They get frustrated. They play the same old stuff. They they get stuck, etc. And then maybe they ask friends or whoever it is. Eventually, some of them start buying books, um, and you can make a little bit of progress, or you can at least gain a little bit of knowledge with books. But the problem becomes you can't really apply it. You can't ask a book a question. You don't know what to do. You you you, you just get stuck. Um, in fact, there there are two specific books that I bought uh, from Princeton, two books full of scales. They were each 200 pages. And I thought I was going to be so smart, like, oh, man, I'm going to learn all these scales. I'm going to learn how to play the guitar up and down the neck, all that stuff. I never made it past, like, the second page on either one of those things. They just went right to the trash can. And that happens over and over and over again. So eventually, what I noticed is that the guitar players start to make the most progress. They, they find that breakthrough moment when they find uh, somebody who basically teaches – to that, that point that they're at in their journey. Um, and most guitar players get stuck at a certain point, but when they find a teacher, someone who can, who can talk to where they are in their journey and help them overcome their challenges and how to uh, open a new level, basically open up a whole new world on the fretboard and get to that next level so they can see what they've been missing, that's really the point where I see guitar players start to take off. And that point, uh, in my experience, usually happens through a course, uh, a good course, a good organized course. I've been part of a lot of courses that, honestly, most of them just go way too fast uh, in terms of they'll want you to start at the very beginning with one chord, and then the next lesson they have you playing a scale, then the next lesson they have you playing an arpeggio. It's like you, you're just not – nobody is going to advance that quickly. It's just not going to happen. Um, so usually when somebody finds a, a nice, good step-by-step -step course that meets their pace, that helps them see that next level – 
what happens is they they get that breakthrough. They get they get to a level to where they finally know the why behind what they're doing. They finally know how do I navigate the fretboard? How can I play, et cetera? And then this is the final level. The final level is um, that the people who make it to quote the top are like the best players, the guys that are just like the best, right? You, you get there through interacting with people directly who are already there. It, there's just no exceptions to that. There's so many nuances. There's so many little things that somebody needs to point out to you or to tell you or to get you to adjust. It's coaching basically is what it comes down to. Um, for example, uh, Joe Satriani, right? Steve Vai learned from Joe Satriani. And so did Kirk Hammett. Um, uh, Jimi Hendrix learned from a guy named Billy Davis. And again, when you, when you, when you look into how do the top guys get to the top, it always comes down to some kind of personal interaction showing you what to do, et cetera. But again, it's got to be the right person. Um, it's got to be somebody who understands where you are and has already overcome that point And it is somewhere where you want to be with your guitar playing, not a completely different style where you want to be. So anyway, I know that was an extremely, extremely long answer, but I think that's the full answer to uh, online, <laughs> online guitar lessons. Got it. Good. Yeah. I, I remember somebody specifically, a student from Breakthrough Guitar talking to me one time and he said his first lesson ever on the guitar, the teacher sat him down and tried to teach him the F major bar chord. That was his first <laughs> first lesson, which if, if you don't know what that is, it hurts. Like It hurts still to this day. It was on the first fret bar chord. My goodness gracious. Um, so yeah. And I, I, it took me personally, I think four or five years when I was young to find something, but it's, it's a pursuit, but once you find it, it's right and it sticks and it yeah. works. And, uh, it's funny that this is breakthrough guitar because it's all about like finding what is that course, the person, whatever it may be that gives you that breakthrough moment in the guitar, uh, and really helps with that. So good. Um, I just had to share the F major. So I think he probably knows who he is. So I'll, I'll wave to him here uh, as well from that conversation. And speaking of, um, you know, very, very complex, crazy things, let's talk easier things that are easy to work through on the guitar uh, as well. What is an easy guitar finger exercise that you'd like to share with everyone? Yeah. So, I mean, I assume if you're asking about an easy guitar finger exercise that you're wanting to increase your dexterity on the fretboard, right? So um, there's a, a basic exercise that, that I know a lot of pros do. Um, I used to use this when I would warm up before a concert or something like that. Uh, or actually just any anytime I am going to really play my guitar, like not if I'm just going to pick it up and mess around for a second, but if I'm going to really play, like play a song or play at a, at a concert or something like that, uh, there's a specific way that I'll warm up. And usually this is, this is not about warm up. This is just one exercise. But usually this is, um, I have a, a system of 10 steps, with, with, which is called unlimited dexterity. And it is a, well, what I just said, it's a series of 10 progressively harder finger exercises that once you climb up the steps, each one of them is easy to get to, right? But by the time you get to the end, you can literally stretch your fingers like this, move around the neck, etc. And, you know, I don't know how many times I have to say, but I previously could not do this, right? If I move my guitar to my left hand, like this is as much as I can, like it's just totally, total disaster, right? A complete beginner. I, I just cannot stretch my fingers like that. But by doing the exercises that I'm talking about now, you know, I can pretty much play whatever I want. Um, not, not, not saying to my own horn. I'm just saying I can stretch my fingers how I want. Let me, put, let me put it that way. So as far as the finger exercise, it's really simple. So basically what I do is I usually start um, here on the fifth fret. And what I will do is I'll play one finger per fret like this. So index finger, ring, uh, middle finger, ring finger, pinky. See how that's one finger per fret? I have the uh, fifth fret, sixth, seventh, eighth. What I'll do is really easily just do this. I'll play the first note, then the second note, then the third note, then the fourth note. But what I'll do is I'll try to relax my hand as much as possible. And I don't want to go fast. I don't want to go slow. I want to go as a comfortable pace that's the most relaxed as I can get it. So something like this. Like that. But by the time I get to this, this note here, I just go down to the next string. So. And I keep going. 
the thing is I don't want to pause in between the strings. So I don't want to do this. I want to keep it going smooth, really smooth and fluid like this. And I'm not trying to be loud. I'm not trying to be fast. I'm just trying to relax. That's the whole point. And by the time I get here, I'm just going to do the same thing in reverse order. So I'm going to start with my pinky. And by the way, I have all my fingers um, on the frets. They're, they're all pressed down when I do this. So I don't play like this. I play, you know, this exercise, they're all pressed. And I just lift them all up like this. So what I'll do is I'll just, I'll be talking to someone or I'll, I'll just kind of do this unconsciously. I will just play up and down like this. And then once my fingers start getting a little bit loose, I'll move around a little bit. So I might go up here and then go down. I just kind of let my fingers wander. And I can't, the thing, the funny thing is if I think about it, I can't tell you where I'm going. I just have to be talking to somebody and I let my fingers start just moving around. Um, but that little exercise, just going one finger per fret, going up and going down, just that alone will help you build a lot more dexterity. It'll help you strengthen and use your pinky and it will help you warm up, you know, before anything that you play. Good. Yeah. I still use those too. Uh, when I'm, when I'm warming up, uh, you can even mix it up, you know, you can even start with that pinky in other areas or, you know, do different patterns of like, first third second fourth it goes crazy all right you, you don't know uh so yeah yeah it is really good and it's it's funny it, it's required for that independence of, of each finger yeah. as well uh for sure so really good um okay so moving right on uh we're gonna move on to a question that I, isn't just here today i've heard this so many times so i'm not surprised that it's here uh What's the difference between electric guitar lessons and acoustic lessons? Yeah, great question. So what's the difference between electric guitar lessons and acoustic guitar lessons? Well, if we think about it, who plays acoustic guitar versus who plays electric guitar? If we make it general, we know that there are exceptions, right? We know there are people who play lead guitar and acoustic. We know there are people who play rhythm guitar exclusively on electric guitar, right? Let's just separate it to very general buckets. If we play mostly rhythm guitar on the acoustic, we play mostly uh, a mix and, and leaning toward lead guitar on the electric guitar, right? So the question is about lessons. What's the difference between acoustic guitar lessons versus electric guitar lessons? Well, it's all about the goal in mind of that particular type of guitar. So if you take, quote, acoustic guitar lessons, the chances are you're going to be learning on an acoustic guitar you're going to be learning things, more things about chords, about strumming patterns, about rhythm. Um, you're going to learn rhythm either way, but rhythm in terms of strumming patterns, uh, things like that. Maybe songs, maybe more about songwriting, etc. With electric guitar lessons, you're probably going to be learning more about leaning into the theory side of things, um, more about how to navigate the fretboard, how to move all around the fretboard, because you're probably going to be using more of the fretboard, right? You're going to learn uh, about lead techniques, probably like bending, sliding, um, uh, different things like that, that allow you to to have that more kind of wild emotional phrasing when you play uh, with your electric guitar. You might also um, learn about like things like effects and pedals and how do you get different sounds and amps and how do you navigate all that stuff? Uh, how do you get the sound that you want? Whereas with an acoustic guitar, you can do some of that, but it's not that common, right? So you're going to be playing your acoustic guitar. Uh, you may venture into something like finger style or classical or something like that, but those are the basic differences. Um, so if you're, you know, thinking about taking guitar lessons, uh, and specifically if you have a choice between acoustic guitar lessons or electric guitar lessons, just think about what do you want to ultimately do on guitar. Um, and if it falls into one of those two categories, well, then you have your direction. Good, good, really good. And I have to check in with you as well because we've been going and going and going and going. How are you feeling? How's 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 the air? How's everything? Are you all right? You you good to continue? I've got like six more ready to go if you're ready. Why don't we do I bet we can do like a rapid fire bonus round? We usually go about an hour, so why don't we why don't we go a little over and do a bonus round this time? Let's let's rapid fire bonus. From, I don't know what my role is in it, but we'll try. Uh, all right. 
Question one. Let's go. How can you play with soul? Good luck rapid firing that, but go ahead. How can you play with soul? Great question. Yeah. Great rapid fire question. How can you play with soul? If I don't play with soul, it sounds like I'm practicing. Sounds like this. Nobody wants to listen to that, right? Here's the key, guys. How do you play with soul? How do you make your playing sound so good that people can't get enough? Like when you listen to your favorite players, the, the Eric Clapton's, the, the David Gilmore's, the, the guys that just like, holy crap, you can't get enough of it. It sounds so amazing. Here's the thing. They're not playing guitar. They're singing through their guitar. That's the answer. So if you, uh, one thing to do uh, to, to help your, your phrasing, your phrasing is how you play. And for, I'll give you an example. So if this is a phrase, whoops, if this is a phrase, it's just those notes. What I might do is if I slide to that last note, well, then it becomes a phrase. Then it becomes more musical. It becomes more lyrical. It becomes more vocal. And that's the point. We want to make it vocal. So if you, if you, when you play, especially when you're improvising, if you start thinking about your singing, and you want to sing the, the, the sound and try to do that through your guitar, you will sound a lot, a lot, a lot more musical. So, for example, instead of doing something basic, like, um, I'm just making this up, by the way. So, instead of doing something basic like this, that sounds like, eh, okay, that guy's practicing, right? The guy's maybe taking a guitar lesson. But if I play something like, I'm just going to go with it. So, like, that's not the greatest playing in the world. The point is, I want to give you a glimpse into the the soul part. It's the soul singing, and that's where the soul comes from. It is soul. Okay, you've done well with that rapid fire, okay? (laughs) You've done well. Uh, Yeah, very true, though. Uh, Again, you look at all the instrumental guitars. We talked Satriani. We talked Vi. We talked all of those guys. I mean, that's exactly what they're doing uh, 100% of the time. I mean, Clapton let's not even get into that uh, let's not even get into srv either right um for sure like craziness um so let's rapid fire another one let's do it what are the best guitar chords specifically for beginners okay guitar chords for beginners i'm going to give you two answers one is if you're a, a brand new beginner you have to have something easy to play right so i mm-hmm. recommend what i call one finger chords it doesn't matter what i'm going to play right now i'm just giving you an example something that's extremely easy to play where you only need a few notes like this. You can just start moving your fingers around. Again, that's not going to sound like a million bucks, but that's not the point. The point is just to start sounding, playing something that sounds musical to start being able to put chords together because chords and chord progressions are what make up songs. And if you can play chord progressions, you can start to play songs, right? You can uh, make your chords more advanced later. When you get to that point of making your chords more advanced later, what most people will say is that you want to play, you want to learn open chords first. The reason you want to learn open chords is because it allows you to play, you know, millions of songs out there. So what are open chords? Um, an open chord is a chord. Most of the time they're played down here in the first three frets, but an open chord is a chord where you're strumming some of the strings that you're not fretting, meaning the string is open. So it has an open string. Uh, meaning like this, would be an all open chord. Doesn't sound very good, but it is a chord and they're all open strings. So examples of common open chords, C, G, D, maybe E minor, A minor. Um, Let's see what else we got. Um, F is going toward bar chords. It's gonna be harder, you'll learn that later. But there there are a few other open uh, chords. Those are the basic ones. There are other more complex sounding chords, like something like that. That's a, what's called a seventh chord, but you'll get to that later. So I would say, um, if you look up cowboy chords on Google, those chords are the basic open chords that you want to learn as a beginner because it allows you to play a lot of songs. That's good. And because cowboy, all right, that's, that's why, go. why not? Uh, so <laughs> let's keep with the beginner idea though. And this kind of combines two questions should very like, extreme beginners like i just got the guitar should beginners at that level take guitar lessons um again it depends on what do we mean by taking guitar lessons do you mean should you learn from somebody else at all 
or do you mean actually going to pay and sit in front of somebody to take a guitar lesson? I mean, it can go both ways. At the very beginning, if you have somebody around you, like a friend or a family member or something, who can just get you started with the absolute basics, that's probably a little bit easier. Um, most people don't have that, though, right? Especially not somebody who's like a good guitar player in their family. So if you find the right teacher who can take it slow enough, because we got to remember, uh, most teachers have what we call the curse of knowledge, which means you know, they have no idea what it's like to be back at the beginning. They were there so long ago. They think that beginners need to learn bar chords and scales and things like that. And that's just absolutely not going to work. Uh, people will get so frustrated and quit when they do that. Um, so again, if you find somebody who can go your pace, the pace that you like, and, and give you little building block steps uh, at the beginning, you will actually progress a lot faster um, and you will enjoy it a lot more as well. So you, you might stick with it. Uh, you might go on to who knows what you might go on to do. Right. But I would say that's a general answer. Um, the short answer is it depends. The longer answer is all the stuff I just said. It's good. It's good. <laughs> that works. Um, all right. So we've got three left and I think they're pretty big ones. So we'll, we'll see what you got for me here. The first one, you kind of mentioned a little bit. I kind of mentioned a little bit. What's the biggest bar chord mistake? Okay, that's a great one. There's a lot of bar chord mistakes. And the reason is because human hands are, are not made to play bar chords on a guitar neck. Have you ever seen a baby who came out of the womb and just slapped his hand on, on a guitar neck and can play a bar chord? I've never seen it. Maybe you have. I don't know of anybody like that. But it's a, it's a super awkward thing to do, right? You have to have all your fingers on there. You have to have a lot of strength, a lot of strength right here. You have to develop that strength. And that's why people can't do it in the beginning. I would say... One of the things that makes it super frustrating in the beginning, uh, which is the biggest mistake that people make, is that our fingers have these little crevices where the joints are. So there's one here, there's one here, there's also one down here. And what they do is when you bar the string, you will, I'll give you two. So I'll give you a bonus one. Uh, the first one is you will place the crease in your finger that the string will go in the crease. And what that means is the string you won't be able to press it down because the string will be um off the fretboard to where it's not pressed down on the fret so you can't hear it and it's in the crease so no matter how hard you press the string down with your finger you can just just you know grip it as hard as you can because that string is in the crease and because the flesh on your finger hasn't you know gotten a little bit harder yet from playing the guitar and playing bar chords the string just goes right up into your finger and you can't ever press it down so how do you fix that all you have to do is just take your finger off the string and move your finger up or down, adjust it up or down so that none of the strings are in the crease. That's number one. The second thing is, and maybe this is even more common actually, we play notes on the guitar like this, right? Like this, but my finger, my finger is curved and I'm pressing the note like this. When people play bar chords, they have that same characteristic where they, they're trying to bar the chord like this, but they're pressing here. And you can't bar all the strings when you're pressing right here. What you need to think about is think about your knuckle, pressing your knuckle into the fretboard. Like I'm pressing, mm -hmm. I'm pressing, the, the pressure is right there. It's not right here. Like I'm playing a normal note. You play normal mm -hmm. notes like this, like you type. When you do bar chords, you want to uh, extend your finger uh, and, and almost like you're trying to bend your finger backwards. Like you're trying to press this part of the knuckle right here into the fretboard. I know it looks strange, but that will also help people um, make their bar chords. The other fingers are a little bit easier to get in place. So I, I would say that's the number one bar chord mistake and then the bonus uh, number two bar chord mistake. Good. Bonus. Bonus. I, I like it. And bonuses on the speed rounds. All right. Uh, <laughs> that's good. Yeah, it's it's I think it's just one of those frustrating things sometimes for people. But um, it's a different way of practicing it's a different method and it's achievable. Like realizing that all those things take time and they're achievable. Uh, and I think being aware of like spot checking where those mistakes yeah. might be, right. Being, being self-aware to go, okay, well, if it's not ringing out, what's going on, is this the yeah. problem or is, uh, the crease, the problem for sure. Um, yeah, this, and the biggest challenge is yet to come in these next two, uh, for you, how do you play chords anywhere on the neck and where do chord shapes come in? Okay. That's a loaded question. So just to make sure I have it right. How do you play chords anywhere on the neck? 
and where do chord shapes come in or where do, where do chord shapes fit into that? Okay. You got so, it. Awesome. So I'm, I'm, I'm not going to give a super detailed answer because we would be here for weeks if I explained literally everything. But what I can do is give you the high level of how does it actually work so you can be like, oh, that's how it works. And then you can explore deeper from there. Okay. In general, what is a chord? A chord, in my definition, is any two or more notes played at the same time. That's it. Two or more notes played simultaneously. Okay. Some people will argue that it's three. So why not? Let's just please everybody and say it's three notes played more, uh, you know, played at the same time. So what makes a chord? In our definition, let's just say three notes. I say it's two, but technically it's two. But to make a major or a minor chord, it's at least three notes played simultaneously. So how do you play a chord anywhere on the neck? Well, first of all, what makes up a chord? Out of those three notes, if you have three notes that you're gonna to play to make a chord at a minimum, well, what three notes are they? If you wanna make, for example, a, let's just say an A minor chord, by definition, and I don't want you to start thinking too much, I just wanna show you this as an example of how this works, okay? And then I'll tell you where chord shapes come in. By definition, the A minor chord is literally, if you look it up in a, in a musical dictionary, A minor equals the A note, the C note, and the E note. So these notes here. And if you can't see what I'm playing, it doesn't matter about the shape. I'll show you about the shapes in a second. So just think A, C, E. So that means if the notes A, C, and E make the chord A minor, well, I know two things. Number one, I know that those notes, A, C, and E, repeat in different places on the neck, right? So that means if I play any A, C, or E note in any combination anywhere on the neck, that means I'm actually playing the A minor chord anywhere on the guitar neck. Let's make one up. So this is the first shape that I showed you. That's just a um, simple shape that you can play. I could also play an A minor chord like this, which is a bar chord, which has more A minor uh, excuse me, has more A and C and E note, has more notes, right? But let me just stick with three for now. So let's say we're gonna make up a crazy chord. Let's say we have our A note here, we have our E note here, and then let's say, let's pick a C note somewhere else. Uh, I'll just pick, I'll take them all on the same, uh, same fret. So the, this note and this note and this note, all that's A, C, and E right there. So I'll play that. It's actually gonna make an A minor chord. So, excuse me, it's, it's here. So this, it's hard to do. I don't, I don't tap when I play guitar, so it's hard to do this. But these notes, there, that's an A minor chord, right? What if I play the C here and the E here and the A here? It's hard to do, but that's also an A minor chord. So the point is the notes that make up the chord are what makes the chord. When you play those notes of the chord, for example, an A minor, an A minor chord is the notes A, C, and E. When you play a combination of A, C, and E anywhere on the guitar neck, you are actually playing an A minor chord. Now, obviously that can get confusing. You can have like these weird, crazy shapes, and some people do. This is where chord shapes come in. So why do we have what's called chord shapes? Well, because it's easy to play. It's easy to play and easy to remember, right? So for example, here's an A minor bar chord. <laughs> easy. I can remember that. I don't have to think about A, C, and E. I can just, here's the shape. Here it is. I know how to play it. What about an open chord? Here's an A minor open chord. That sounds like a major seven chord. Oh, here we go. So we got a minor chord. That's an A minor chord, right? There are other shapes. Like, for example, I can play it right here. That's also an A minor chord. Um, and usually it's these little shapes that people remember. Now, what I want to point out is, is that Number one, shapes make it easier to play the chords. You don't have to think about the notes or anything, right? You can just remember the chord. The second thing I want to point out is that most people think the shape is the chord. So for example, if I learn an F bar chord, F major, right here. If somebody learns that, and then they're taking lessons some, sometime later or whatever, and then they're learning an F major somewhere over here, they might think, I actually read this one. Somebody said, I've, I thought I already learned that chord. Well, you didn't. You, you, you learned that shape. There's many shapes. There's almost infinite shapes. So that's how you, that's what a chord is. That's how you make a chord anywhere on the neck. 
And that's how shapes come into play. Why are shapes useful? You did all right. You did all right. I'm, I'm impressed. I'm impressed. Also, I noticed that when you are tapping, uh, you're, you're not playing, you know, any of the seven string heavy metal stuff that I am, you know, you got to get more into that. Okay. I'll do my best. You, instead you have the 10 string. All right. So you've got me beat there. So I've, I'm very beat on the 10. Uh, but the last question, we have one more that was sent in that I think is a good way to end and kind of wrap things up for us. Uh, it's also relating to guitar lessons. We've had a lot of questions about that, which is which is clearly a theme here that we're getting. Um, yeah. So it's good. Here's the question. Can you learn properly and effectively the guitar with online guitar lessons? Yeah. Okay. So short answer. Can you learn uh, you know, guitar properly online? Yes. We've already talked about this um, in one of the other questions, one of the other lessons, but I'll kind of summarize what we talked about. The short answer is yes. The slightly longer answer is it depends, right? And the real answer is that it depends on what do you want to do? How, how uh, do you learn best and who or what do you have access to? So like I talked about before, as Pat Metheny said, 95% of jazz out there is crap. And there's only 5% of it that's really any, you know, worth listening to, right? The same thing is true in the guitar lesson world. 95% of the stuff out there just isn't, it's just not good. Like it's just not going to help you uh, at least very quickly. It's probably going to lead to frustration. A lot of it is just the wrong information going to lead you down the wrong path, et cetera. So again, it, it depends on what you have access to. Do you have access to an online program that you personally can actually learn from? Uh, does it make sense to you? Does it help you reach your personal goals? For example, if you want to play blues, does it help you get to that point? Or is somebody trying to teach you how to play Mary Had a Little Lamb? That's not going to help you learn blues, right? It's just two different two different directions. Um, and then finally, like I said, do you does it go at a pace that you can learn from that's comfortable for you, where you can understand what they're saying at, let's say, level one? And then level two, like, okay, I got level one. Now level two, great. I can add to it. I can apply it. I can play it. I get why, et cetera. Then you go to level three. Does it work in that progression? If so, if that's the case, then yes, you can take your guitar playing a long, long way with online guitar lessons. Like I said before, if you, at the very top level, if you want to become a top level guitar player, if you want to become a, a real complete guitarist, a true musician, a true guitar player, it's going to take working with somebody, right? A real person. And that person is going to need to, as I said before, um, going to have to understand where you were. They're going to have to be a teacher that you get along with in the way that you, you like their teaching style, that you can actually understand them, right? That you, um, you get the way that they deliver information to you. Uh, and also it needs to be somebody who is already where you want to be with your specific skills. For example, if you want to play blues, you need to go to somebody who can already play blues the way that at least very similar to how you want to play it. You don't need to go to the guy that's playing, uh, you know, campfire open chord songs. That that person is not going to be able to teach you blues. It's just that's just not that person. Right. So, again, that's the long answer. Short answer is, yeah, absolutely. You just have to find the right way, the right method, the right person. Well done. And look, I'll get us both widescreen. There's that Satriani uh, we all know and love. And there's there's the creepy Gene Wilder that is just always in the background of my videos as well. Um, yeah, you know, I used to have a teacher that looked just like him. I'd hop on lessons online and it would it would freak him out a bit. Uh, so that's why it stays there. But I, I just want to add a little bit to that. I mean, we, we know we're here with Breakthrough Guitar. We have so many systems, so many things uh, that so many people have found valuable. And we actually have a lot of those people watching. So thanks for being here. Guitar Sweep yeah. literally popping in and saying, thank you, John, for the simplest explanation I ever found to making my own music over anything. Uh, Amazing. We, we've got uh, another one over here. Not a question this is from James. Not a question, but I've really enjoyed what little bit of breakthrough guitar site and courses I've been able to view so far. Can't wait to keep going. Um, awesome. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's just a testament to. Yeah, it, it absolutely is possible to yeah. learn online. Absolutely. Um, and John, I, I would say that that's pretty good. We, we crushed at least one thousand twenty eight questions today. <laughs> 
and we did it very well. So before I conclude us, any last words, anything you'd like to say before we, we end our, our Q and A? Yeah, actually I would say that this goes for anything out there. Um, the majority of the information that you're going to hear that you're going to see out there in any, let's say industry it is, it's always going to be the same. Um, uh, what's the word that starts with a D distribution. It's going to be the same distribution. What I mean is most of it is the same old stuff that everybody's already heard. Everything you watch on the news, everything you can read online. It, it just, it's just how it works, right? It, it's usually always the same. And the same thing is true with guitar. So when you go out there and you go, you know, look for guitar lessons online or something like that, the chances are you're going to hear the same old stuff over and over and over. Like somebody's going to be showing you the minor pentatonic scale or showing you how to play the G chord, or the D chord or something like that. And that's most of the stuff out there. Right. So I just want to say that um, because of that, it's it's in what you don't see and it's in what you don't know. That that's where the progress is. Right. It's, it's in what you're missing. It's not what, what you already see out there. Everybody already sees that stuff. And if that stuff worked, then everybody would be good at guitar right now. But they're missing those key things, those key ingredients, like the, the real secrets, if you will, to to actually becoming a guitar player, to becoming a real musician, to becoming a guitar player that you want to be. And that's what we try our best to share. Um, so that's why I say, you know, if you if you want more of these uh these answers to these questions, if you, if you want more of these insights, the, the sort of backstage uh, secrets, if you will, of like what real musicians talk about and know uh, backstage, then, you know, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Like we, we try our best to constantly come out with uh, good answers to questions that real people are really asking all the time. And we try to give our best uh, behind the scenes answer to what will actually make you become a better guitar player, what actually works. That is right. And it's thanks to y'all that we get to do it. Uh, you know, I say it all the time. We are surrounded by guitars. I have guitars behind me and in front of me all day doing this work because of everybody watching, everybody sending questions, everybody out there. So just a huge bit of appreciation to all of you for supporting all of us here, but also for being here right now and and for helping us enjoy our time, which I enjoyed very much, John. So thank you, Jonathan, for hopping on for 27 minutes and 11 seconds extra so far uh, <laughs> over what we anticipated and expected, but we got it done. I think we did a great job it. and I really appreciate you being here, my friend. Likewise, appreciate it, man. And All right. you guys watching. Yeah, thank you all. We will be back again with another Top 10 Q&A Live. So feel free to start sending in questions. We'll make sure we answer those on the next one. Until then, we appreciate you all, and we will talk soon. Later, y'all. Yes.